Well, good evening. I think we've got most of the participants uh, signed in now. My name is Jacob Powell with Oregon State University Extension Service. I'm the General Agricultural Extension Agent in Sherman and Wasco counties based out of the Dalles in Morrow, Oregon. And this evening, I'm also joined by Sylvia Rondon, uh, OSU Extension Entomology Specialist from Hermiston. And so the focus this evening is on alfalfa weevil control and integrated pest management and kind of focusing on uh, issues re revolving around uh, insecticide resistance issues, uh, chlorofurifos bans that could potentially happen in the future, and then just kind of overall alfalfa weevil uh, population biology and, and best control strategies. And so again, kind of some best management practices on our Zoom meeting this evening. Uh, if you have a question, feel free to type that into the chat box. Uh, we can also open it up for questions at the end of this conversation as well. For the duration of the presentation, if you can keep yourself muted, that would be great. And then uh, unmute yourself if you have questions at the end there. And so I primarily work in Sherman, Owasco County with OSU Extension, but across the river in Washington, Klickadat County, producers there produce a lot of alfalfa. As you can see here, this uh, sign that's there as you go into Goldendale, saying that basically they they grow 10,000 more acres of alfalfa than they do wheat, and so their alfalfa hay is a major uh, production component of the agriculture over there. And so producers over there are having some increasing concerns over alfalfa weevils and just overall integrated pest management sustainability of dealing with insect pests uh, that they have with alfalfa there. So this is a zoomed in image of basically part of a hoop net that somebody was out serving a field. I believe this is in California and you can see all the little larvae in this net. Those are all alfalfa weevils. And it's hard to see in here. There are some uh, grayer dots in there as well. And those gray dots are the mature uh, weevil adults that are in there. And so one major issue with alfalfa weevil is that there's this insecticide chlorpyrifos that has been used with alfalfa in the past. And this graph here is showing that basically, you know, that the uppermost line here that's going up and down, that's showing the total use of chlorpyrifos that year in kilograms across the United States. And so the majority of this use then is broken in the dark blue that forms the majority of that slope. And that's for use of it in orchards and grapes. And so huge primary use of chlorpyrifos is in the orchard and grapes. Alfalfa makes up a very small component and it's really difficult to actually even make that out in this chart it's kind of this um, lighter blue green. You really can't see it till you look at, I believe, 2010, 2012. You can see there, there's a little bit of blue in there. So overall, not a lot of use with chlorpyrifos for alfalfa compared to all these other crops that are using it. So alfalfa, you know, unfortunately, that's not the main crop that's being used for, but chlorpyrifos is very uh, important pesticide for us to use with alfalfa. So the potential of that being taken away really opens up the, the door for some concern across agriculture in Oregon. And so the next slide here, these are just some of the common brand names of insecticides that are used that contain chlorpyrifos as the main active ingredient. So there's several different products there that producers can use on alfalfa. And the issue really came up with this being banned, uh, I believe two times in a row recently, it's came very close to being banned um, with the Oregon legislature. And so just recently, this last spring, they had House Bill 4109 that was going to ban aerial use of that immediately, uh, would prohibit spraying within 300 feet of a school campus. And then eventually in 2000, uh, 2022, it would then be banned from being used in the state. And so basically, if a farmer needed to use that chemical, they would no longer be able to. However, given the walkout that happened with the climate concerns, that bill did not pass. And so for now, things are looking okay with it. But, you know, given how two times in a row it's almost been passed, there's a good chance it's going to be banned from Oregon in the future. 
And so Oriented Part of Agriculture is trying to work on this. They do have a, a work group that has been meeting periodically to try to figure out um, what the best solution is here. Basically, you know, are there, are there alternatives to using this that would also be effective for crops while minimizing some of the impacts to human health? And again, you know, alfalfa, chlorpyrifos is one of the, compared to other crops, the chlorpyrifos use is pretty small with just alfalfa, but it's a very effective tool. So there's con some concern there. And so again, for those who aren't familiar, chlorpyrifos is an organophosphate-based insecticide. And so it's a, a chlorinosterase inhibitor. And so it can have some large negative impacts on human health on the human nervous system, if not applied uh, correctly or safely. But I will say that compared to a lot of other crops, alfalfa fields, you know, that insecticide is used and producers do a pretty good job of staying out of those fields. They don't have other workers that are going in those areas, you know, compared to some of these other crops, it's a lot easier to keep people out of those fields once they, once they have applied it. And so then just, you know, are there alternatives to using chlorpyrifos? And the issue is that yes, there are some other chemicals you can use, but a lot of these uh, pyrethroids actually cause more damage to other beneficial insects on alfalfa. And in addition, this pyrethroids are what folks are finding in uh, alfalfa weevils are becoming resistant to this insecticide. And so this is a study in Mountain region that was, this is primarily in California that they were really having some issues, primarily Northern California. So really you know, not that far from the Oregon border that this table here is just showing simply that, you know, they had an organic field that they took weevils out of. So organic field that had never been sprayed with insecticides before. So they took weevils out of that field and applied a recommended rate of pyrethroids and had, you know, 92% kill rate on those weevils, so very successful. But then they went to these conventional fields that, that were having some issues that the producers had applied the insecticide and they weren't seeing much of a kill rate, so they became concerned and so they used a the recommended rate and you know they only had a three to 15% efficacy rate on those weevils. So it's suggesting that there's definitely some resistance that is occurring with the pyrethroids. And so, some of these ongoing concerns really made me want to try to talk about this and just try to educate producers more on what's going on with alfalfa weevils. And I greatly appreciate having Sylvia Rond on here to kind of provide more of her true expertise on the alfalfa weevil and just to keep us informed that, you know, there are some other strategies that we can be thinking about proactively now. So when chlorpyrifos does become banned, um, there can be some good workarounds in place and we can, you know, continue to effectively manage alfalfa weevil, have good production with our, our alfalfa, and also minimize our impacts to beneficial insects and human health in the areas as well. So with that, I can go ahead and hand it over to Sylvia Rondon here and kind of go over some additional information on the alfalfa weevil. Get my screen share to stop here. Okay, I'm seeing your PowerPoint there, Sylvia. Of course, I forgot to unmute. There you go. We can see your slideshow and we can hear you now, so that's great. Can you hear me? We can. Excellent. So, good afternoon. Um, as Jacob said, my name is Sylvia Rondon. I am an extension entomology specialist with OSU. And I am based in Eastern Oregon at the Hermiston Agricultural Research and Extension Center in Hermiston. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation to talk about alfalfa weevil. Uh, I have been doing some, al some alfalfa work for the last probably four or five years. However, if you check my background, because of where I am located, I am better known for my work on potatoes. Here in the Columbia Basin, we have over 200 different crops that are grown and our, the mission of our research station, it is to work in all irrigated crops. 
and until very recently, I have been the only extension entomologist in the state of Oregon. Uh, in, back in September 2019, we just hired a new entomologist for the western side, so now I feel a little bit more relief from my duties of expanding the mission of only related crops to all crops. But regardless, alfalfa is indeed an extremely important crop not only for the Columbia Basin, but for the entire state. And today I was asked to talk specifically about alfalfa weevil. And I thought it would be a good idea to talk about a little bit about the biology, ecology, and some of the management options, especially focusing on what Jacob just mentioned about the potential possibility of this insect developing resistant to pesticides, okay? Um, I wish, I mean, this is the new norm for all of us. Uh, I think this was supposed to be a field day on site, but now we have to do it remotely. Hopefully, regardless of the way we are delivering our information, that you guys will get as much as you can from this. And please feel free to interrupt me anytime. Uh, I always tend to talk very fast and I know I have a strong accent. <laughs> So just please stop me if uh, something is not clear and I will be happy to repeat it, okay? Uh, hopefully all of you know about the, uh, I'm pretty sure you, all of you know about alfalfa in the sense of the agronomy of the crop. Uh, the genus of this crop is Medicago sativa. It's from the family Fabacea and it's a perennial flowering plant. And as you know, it is an uh, extremely important uh, crop and in the Columbia Basin used as a rotational crop. And being a perennial plant, you can have this crop uh, for four to four, eight years and you can cut it three to four times during the year. And this is a special characteristic of the crop, being able to be year round pretty much and having several harvest time of the crop uh, allows the possibility for many decolonization of many insects, meaning that a lot of insects use uh, alfalfa as a green crop because that's more potentially one of the crops that will be always green and available. Okay, alfalfa is also very important also because depending of where we're going to take the alfalfa to, if it's seed production, because uh, it really hosts a lot of plenty of beneficials, including bees, leaf cutter bees, and things like that. So from every angle you can see, alfalfa is an extremely important crop. Can you hear me well? Just say this. <laughs> yes, you're coming in loud and clear for me, Sylvia. Okay. So of course, like with any crop, there's, uh, when you're growing a crop, there's a lot of limitations. And the limitations come in the form of diseases. And on the top hand side, you can see some of the most common diseases on alfalfa, like leaf spot, downy mildew. Weeds are tremendous, a tremendous problem when you're growing alfalfa. You really have to make sure that you have to have a very good stand from the get-go to have a very good crop. And of course, I'm going to be focusing about insects, right? At the bottom of the screen, you can see a diversity of different crop insects that can affect your alfalfa crop. Like for example, uh, this, uh, this is a looper. Hopefully you can see my the mouse moving here. You have some uh, army worms, you have aphids, different species. And of course the insect that we're going to be talking about today is the alfalfa weevil, okay? Uh, I like this picture and I like this slide, although, although if you see something like this, it looks like this alfalfa weevil is massive. But actually, as you have seen it in the field, the weevil is pretty small, but it's very distinctive and characteristic and easy to identify. And honestly, that is the key of any management program for insects, to be able to correctly identify the problem. That's what I'm going to walk you through the life cycle of this insect. Here you can see again the picture of the alfalfa weevil. Of course, you have the males and the females. This is a beetle, it's a coleoptera. So after they mate, 
these insects, the adults, over winter in the stubble or in the alfalfa during the winter. And as soon as the temperatures are right, the, the, the adults emerge from the overwintering sites where they are, uh, you know, sheltering during the, the winter months. And immediately they mate and the females immediately start laying eggs. You can see a nice picture of a cluster of eggs. Depending on the temperature, it takes one or two weeks for those eggs to hatch into a larvae, a very tiny larvae. And this insect goes through five different uh, instar larvae. We call them larvae one, two, three, four, and five. And after that, uh, this obviously it's probably the main damaging stage. The larvae is the one that is going to be feeding on your, on your foliage especially. When they reach the last instar, they will drop into the ground and they will form what is called a, a pupa and around the pupa to protect it, a cocoon. This is what you see kind of like this uh, waxy uh, cover that is sheltered in the pupae. And from that, you will, after one or two weeks, you will have the emergence of the adult and then the life cycle continues, okay? Usually, depending on where we are in the state, you can have somewhere between one or two generations, although the adults can live for up to a year, okay? Meaning that if you have newly hatched adults of alfalfa weevil, you can still see them surviving until the following year. It's a very interesting life cycle. As I mentioned at the beginning, I think the base of any IPM program, it is correct identification. And this is a good example because on the left-hand side, you have the alfalfa weevil that we're talking about. Very characteristic, you know, the, the, the color, these stripes here determine the species. On the top, you can see that the scientific name is Iperica postica, although there is different Ipericas in alfalfa, okay? But this postica is the one that has these long stripes. And on the right-hand side, you see something that is similar in size, but it's a completely different group. Um, it's from the same family. They have the snouts, but it's a P alfalfa weevil, okay? Which the biology is very different. So this is when the tricky part starts because the correct identification is extremely for important before you're developing your pest management programs. Let me give you just a tidy bit of information about the different instars. And I just show you the, the cluster of eggs before. These cluster of eggs are laid directly in the alfalfa, usually in the stems. And actually right now I have a student that is playing with alfalfa weevils and collecting them and opening the, the le each leaves and counting how many eggs do we find per branch, it's pretty cool. Each female during the lifespan of, of their life, they can lay approx between 500 to 2000 eggs and that's, that's a pretty large number, okay? However, not all the eggs are laid at the same time, meaning that if they form a peak, a peak when they, they lay much more concentration, they have some sort of physiological regulation where the females can somehow sense when is the best time to increase the production of eggs. Like for example, I know that in my area right now, the peak of laying egg was two weeks ago. So when I went to check my alfalfa plots, I would just sweep and I would collect hundreds of very tiny larvae that just hatch from those eggs, okay? So that's a very important characteristic of this insect. I already talked about the larvae. There's different sizes. We have larvae one, two, three, four, and five. And it's very easy to identify them. The picture that you see there on the right-hand side is very characteristic. They really have a typical lime green with some white, two white straps on the side. And if you look really careful, the tip where the head is supposed to be is very dark. Okay, this is a characteristic that, for example, the alfalfa pea weevil won't have. That's why it's so easy to identify the larvae or the alfalfa weevil. As I mentioned, the larvae, it's the main damaging stage, although the adults also can feed on the foliage. But if you compare an, an a larvae, an adult, how much do they eat? 
the, the immature stages are the ones that fit much, much more compared to the adults, okay? They go directly into the foliage and they like the freshly emerged buds. So that's why you should start looking for them. Remember that after the last instar, the larvae is going to drop into the ground, it's going to form a pupae, and it's going to form what I already mentioned, which is known as a cocoon, okay? The cocoon is kind of like a protecting stage. And you may wonder, why do I care about the different instars? Because if you think about it, if you see the, the let's say, the skin of the larvae compared of the protection of the cocoon or the, of the very thick layer of the exoskeleton of the adult, the chances that you will have to control them are going to be much higher when you're targeting the larvae stage, especially the younger ones, compared to if you're spraying or using any sort of insecticide application when mostly what you see are cocoons or adults, okay? Lar bottom line, just to make things more clear, larvae are much easier to control compared to the adults. That's why it's so important to know what kind of life stage do you have in your field on any given day. And the adults, I already explained how to identify them. They are very distinctive. Uh, they can also feed on the foliage. And as I mentioned, they overwinter in the winter months in the soil at the base of the plant. Okay, any questions so far? I know it's a little bit hard to have interaction here, but if you just send me a chat, probably Jacob can tell me if there's any question there. This is a picture that shows clearly uh, damage by, uh, by this alfalfa weevil. In some cases, you don't really notice the larvae or the adults, but you can see very clear the damage. And you won't see the larvae or the adult until the damage is way too severe. That's why I always encourage growers to do some monitoring so they know when are you going to find these different stages and when are you going to have peaks of larvae or adults in your field to better predict when is the best time to control them. Okay, just a couple of pictures to show you how do they skelet, um, feed on the, on the plants. And remember what I said before, they tend to go towards the top of the plant, the newly emerged uh, buds. So if you want to look for them, that's the place you should be targeting when you do your scouting. Uh, this picture, I like it. I remember uh, one of my colleagues from Wisconsin shared it with me. But you can see this is an alfalfa field, three year old. And on the back, you can see all these brown spots. And I can tell you for a fact that those were spots completely defoliated by this insect. If you don't control them early on, you can really have tremendous yield losses, okay? A little bit more about this insect. Um, I, I have a soft spot for the studies of populations on populations of origin of species, and there's no difference with this insect. The genus Ipera postica, the alfalfa weevil, is distributed pretty much throughout the United States. You can find them as far as Alaska. You can find them pretty much in all Europe, Western and Eastern Europe, and also they, ha they have been found on the southern part of Russia and the new uh, ex-Soviet Union country. So the expansion of this, of this insect distribution is pretty large. Where can you find them? Mainly on plants from the alfalfa family, as are the ones you can see here. Do you notice alfalfa, medica gosativa, vermetic is also from the same group of alfalfa, these uh, different or uh, common weeds that we have in the area. So it's not really, as you won't only find them in alfalfa, but you will find them also in related crops, closely related to alfalfa as well, okay? And the feeding damage is going to be very typical in all of them. Jacob already showed you a picture kind of like that. This picture was taken by my, I took the picture a couple of years ago. And I have to tell you that here in the Columbia Basin, we don't have alfalfa weevil in these high numbers every single year. I have been in this area for the last 16 years and I have seen at least three rounds, cyclic kind of four to five years when we see explosions of outbreaks of this insect. 
I know this is not the case in other locations in Oregon, okay? So that is why maybe here in Eastern Oregon, we are a spare of, the, of forcing this insect to develop resistance to pesticides compared to other locations where you do have alfalfa weevil as a huge problem year after year, okay? That's something very important to keep in mind. Again, this picture was taken two years ago, and on that, I'm going to contradict myself because this was taken two years ago, and this year, we are not seeing as many as you see on this picture, but we are seeing a very large number. And that was only two years, not four or five, as I mentioned at the beginning. So my feeling is that all this climate variation, let's not talk about really climate change, but all these changes in weather patterns are really affecting the biology of this insect, at least in my area. So instead of seeing them in big numbers, four to five years, now it seems that it's, that time frame is getting shorter and shorter, okay? So I, I am what you call an IPM expert, integrated pest management, and I do develop pest management programs for different crops. And the idea behind this IPM philosophy, because for me, this is really a philosophy, it is to develop solid strategies that can allow us to prevent and suppress pests, okay? And I know we want to have this idea of elimination, but in the case of insects, that really doesn't happen because um, it's, I don't think it would be environmentally reasonable to completely eliminate a pest, okay? Unless it's a new introduction, okay? But what we do is we develop programs where we want to prevent and suppress to have a minimum impact, okay? And one of the basics of any IPM program, it is to do sampling or monitoring, okay? That is really the base along with correct identification of your problem. And you ask to any IPM expert in the world, and that's what they will tell you, that sampling is really the base of successful IPM programs. Why? Because if you take the time to go to the field, or if you send a fieldman to go to the field, they are going to be able to determine if there is, there is a problem or not, if the insect is present or not. And remember that there's different techniques including biological control. There's good insects that control bad insects. If you go and you do your sampling, you may see that there is a very large number of beneficials. So all these factors really you have to take in consideration before deciding what should you do next, okay? So uh, it's, it's really a lot of things that you have to put pieces together. This slide was uh, one of my very close colleagues that unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, Larry Godfrey. He was one of the best alfalfa weevil researchers in the world. He was at University of California. He did have a huge body of information about alfalfa weevil. And actually the data that Jacob presented earlier was coming from his program. And Larry recommended some, this following pattern that you see here on the graph in the middle, which is pretty straightforward just by using a sweep net and a honey and eight sweep technique, basically going right and left and collecting for 20 steps. And if you find more than 20 larvae in your 20 steps, that is the threshold that they consider for doing something, meaning Indians doing something like choosing to spray a pesticide if, if that's what you choose to do, okay? So, that was a pretty straightforward uh, recommendation from Godfrey's program, University of California, about how to go and do, uh, and do your estimation of your, when it's time to do something. On the right hand side here, you see our famous Pacific Northwest Insect Handbook. I hope you are all familiar with that. Uh, here at the bottom, you see the link, or you just go online and Google PNW Insect Management Handbook. This handbook is really the go-to information for any crop that you grow in the Pacific Northwest. Many of us is in charge of a different chapter. I am responsible for the potato chapter. I was also in charge of the lettuce and onions. 
and different experts are in charge of different different uh, of those chapters. But basically, if you go into this um, book that is available online again, or you can buy it in your extension office, uh, there is a strict recommendations about all the specifics about how to do um, specific about the pest, alfalfa weevil in this case, specifics about sampling techniques, specifics about what kind of pesticides should you use or, or should the experts recommend to use to control your pest problem, okay? So I won't go through the, all the text here, but it's, it's information that you can find in this insect handbook. And this is the kind of information that you will get from that site. And especially we pay close attention in reviewing the chemical section, because as you know, there are a lot of chemicals that, uh, that every year they have to be reevaluated and they can be removed and we can add new pesticides. And most of this information comes thanks to people like Jeffco or I, where we do pesticide trials for chemical companies. They use our data to solidify or not the validity of the different chemical products and how eff efficacious they are in controlling different pests. On this, side, on this slide specifically, you can see a few of the pesticides that are recommended for alfalfa weevil control. You can see several uh, uh, pyrethroids. And Jacob mentioned a little bit about those, those pesticides. Those pesticides, uh, I know the price is reasonably affordable. Uh, in different crops, it's the same situation. The pyrethroids may be the pesticides to go to because of the price they, they are available in the market. But there is a huge problem with this type of group of pesticides. And there's a, a long list of pesticides there. And the problem is that they are not soft on beneficials and even in good insects. And believe it or not, even if you don't think or you don't really understand the value of those natural enemies controlling naturally pests in the field, they do. There is a lot of scientific information that come back up that the statement, okay? So these pyrethros are super harsh on natural enemies. And especially if you spray these pyrethros early in the season, what you're doing is basically you are wiping out your population of natural enemies, therefore allowing the pest to take off. And it can be alfalfa weevil, it can be loopers, it can be aphids on any other pest, okay? That's what, I don't know if there's any specific research regarding when should you stop spraying pyrethros in alfalfa. But for example, if I share with you my experience on potatoes, we never spray pyrethros before June 15. We plant potatoes in April in average, okay? Because we don't want to eliminate our natural enemies and really benefit of the good action in the field. Okay, so again, there is no really research that I'm aware of that will tell you the information of when you should not spray pyrethros in alfalfa, but there is information in other crops. This is just a potential topic of, of research for alfalfa crop in the future. And the list of pesticides that you can use in alfalfa is pretty long. And those include several of the, the, the ones from the chlorpyrifos group that Jacob already mentioned. And if you think that your warrior or your lanate are going to be still available in your toolbox in the future, I'm afraid that doesn't look like it's going to happen in the future. As Jacob said before, ODA, OSU has formed a working group regarding the chlorpyrifos, and this is already an ongoing uh, working group for the last couple of years. My program just got some funding to focus on looking of alternatives or chlorpyrifos in crops like potatoes and onions. I may be able to squeeze some alfalfa research there. But the point is that I want you to be aware that we have to be prepared to start looking for replacements for this particular group, okay? And this is something that has been coming for years, discussions, but it seems now that it's, it's going to happen in the next couple of years. 
So again, there's no, no way back, but this, now we have to look forward and to start looking what can potentially be those alternatives that can be good or as good as chlorpyrifos in your specific crop, okay? Something to keep in mind. Uh, this site here, it's the site, and on the top you can see here the, the WW site of all the chapters specifically for alfalfa. There is a, a chapter for alfalfa hay, alfalfa seed, and all the information um, can be found here. You just have to Google and the information will pop there. And of course, there's always myself working on insects and other researches with, uh, within the OSU system that we can help you finding the information if you can not. Any questions of, about alfalfa weevil? No? Before, so just to finish with alfalfa weevil, my alfalfa weevil talk here, uh, I just didn't want to overwhelm you with too much information, but uh, I have been working for at least the last four to five years with groups in California, uh, Idaho, Arizona, and Montana. Montana is the leader on alfalfa research at this moment. And uh, as I mentioned early on, we, at least in Eastern Oregon, and I'm not sure what the situation in the central part, uh, I, we don't have alfalfa weevil resistant to pesticides here in my neck of the wood, okay? It doesn't mean that it's not happening. What it means is that we have not really done too much research on that arena. I have tried several times to get some funding to be able to deep, go deep into more research in alfalfa, but not very successful so far. I won't give up. I will keep applying for other uh, pots of money to be able to continue to do the work that we want to do. However, I do have very good collaborations with my other colleagues in the other states, and I am submitting a lot of samples of alfalfa weevils to those states that do have commissions that are funding the research. Okay, We don't have a commission for us here, but they do have their commissions there. So I'm kind of squeezing our Oregon data with their data so they can help us out evaluating what's the status of resistance of our alfalfa weevil population, at least in Eastern Oregon. If you are interested in the same type of collaboration, I will ask you to connect with Jacob and maybe Jacob and I can talk about that and I can get some samples from him and. I can ship them to Montana or Arizona for testing. I think that's a nice possibility of killing many birds with one stone, okay? So just connect with him if, if, if you want to work with us, collecting some samples for us, and then I can take it uh, from there into connecting with my colleagues, okay? That was my pitch for help right there. So with that, <laughs> I just want to show you a couple of slides with other important group of insects that are that can affect alfalfa. I know alfalfa aphids and uh, can be a potential huge problem. And aphids, I think they're a fantastic group to work, but they are very difficult because the diversity of aphids that you can find, especially in alfalfa, the diversity is huge. I have been doing some uh, aphid work for many years already, and we always get stuck in the identification part. Because as you see on these pictures, there's some that are easy, like the cowpea aphid, the spotted alfalfa aphid may be very easy to identify, but others are very difficult. And unfortunately, at least in the United States, we only have three people, experts in taxonomies on aphid identification. So I know them really well, so many times they do help me out. So one of the things that my program is trying to develop, it is to focus not on the, the, the difficulty on identifying aphids is because morphologically they look alike and the identification keys are really very difficult to follow unless you are an expert and unless you have a lot of time to do it. I run many projects, many different crops, many different insects, 
So I cannot really sit in front of the microscope for hours or days or weeks doing the sorting myself, although my initial background was in taxonomy. So what I am trying to do in my program, right now I have a postdoc that has a very strong background on molecular, uh, on molecular DNA barcoding. It is to do identification of insects, in this case specifically for aphids, but at the molecular level, which is much easier, believe it or not. It sounds fancy, which it is, I guess, but the technique is pretty straightforward. You collect your insects, you test them molecularly, and then you compare the DNA with uh, the codes that are on a library online. So it's pretty cool. And I was really hoping to have this project going this year. I, uh, I was planning on bringing a scientist from Brazil to my program, but with all this virus, con virus 19 situation, uh, I don't know if I will be able to bring this person, if not until the end of the year. So I'm not giving up, I'm just postponing it for later. But that's something that I'm planning to do. Uh, so again, alfalfa aphids, very diverse in alfalfa. And the problem with aphids is because of the way they feed on the plant. I don't know if you can see, uh, well, no, no, these pictures is really, well, this one here on the right hand side of the blue aphid, if you look closely, you can see them kind of bending on a 45 degree. And so what they are doing is they are injecting their mouth part inside the plant. And this mouth part works kind of like a vacuum. So when it goes inside, <laughs> It pretty much sucks the sap of the plant. And these are flowing feeders. And that is huge in the success of these aphids in general on being excellent vectors of diseases, pathogens, okay? Especially viruses. So not all the aphids are able to vector viruses. They can, but there are some that are more efficient than others. So that's what is, again, important to identify them correctly, okay? So hopefully this is something that I will be able to develop in the future. Uh, one, the barcoding identification, and two, we do a lot of studies related to insect plant interaction. And that's exactly what I would, would like to do with aphids in alfalfa. I use alfalfa as a, as a source crop for insects that move into potatoes in the Columbia Basin. And that goes along with this last insect that I'm going to talk about to you, which is ligos bugs. And I'm pretty sure you have seen them, your alfalfa. And until recently, we thought that ligos was probably, uh, they do prefer alfalfa compared to other different crops. However, one of my postdocs is doing some very interesting study where he's putting a diversity of crops potatoes, alfalfa, carrots, peas, and wheat in cages, releasing ligos in the center, and then we evaluate with a preference of this insect for different crops. And listen to this, ligos, which you can, this is an adult, of course, you recognize them for this kind of triangle here on the, on the dorsal here, okay? It's pretty easy to ID. And, um, when you give them a choice of different crops, they do prefer to land on potatoes, even though alfalfa is present, but they, they do love alfalfa as an oviposition site. And this is the picture that you see here in the center, a stem and the ones, the things, little things that you see here, here are uh, ligos bug eggs. They insert the egg on the epidermis of the plant, okay? So, I could talk about LIGOS for hours, but I think my time is up. <laughs> but this is another important insect that you will see in your alfalfa. And in some cases, they can cause a, a lot of damage because of the huge numbers of this insect. This insect feeds, has the same type of mouth part that aphids, but the huge difference is this. While the aphids, the mouth part goes directly into the flowing, making them good vectors of viruses. The ligos, they are cell feeders. It's kind of like they just poke the surface of the, of the epidermis. And after they poke the cell, they kill the cell and they kind of spit. So the feeding is completely different. 
meaning that these insects are not really vectors of diseases, but they can cause a lot of damage of the tissue, the alfalfa and all those different crops. Oops. So with that, I finish my short presentation. I hope things will get better in the future where we can meet in person in the field and I can show you all this cool stuff. Uh, this is a picture on the left hand side of my lab. I do have a pretty large collection of insects, many from coming from alfalfa. I like things to be interactive. So <laughs> hopefully we will be able to do that in the near future. Thank you so much.